You know the phrase, loose lips sink ships? Well, today's case shows that maybe a sinking ship might not be the worst fate in the world, especially when life in prison is the consequence. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Killer Bites. I'm your host, Mac, and the story I have for you today is about the interrogation of two killers who shot an innocent man in his car in the middle of the day. This is the story of the interrogation and arrest of Marquia Hamilton and Jaria Shield, the killers who won't confess. It was a Thursday evening on July 23rd, 2020 in Orlando, Florida, when the LeBron family got a knock at their door. When police arrived at the scene, they found their son Eloy LeBron dead in his car. That day, Eloy and his friend were driving on West Anderson Street and Jernigan Avenue. Around 12.30 p.m. in broad daylight, a car sped past them and shots were fired from the vehicle. His friend was able to duck down and avoid injury, but Eloy, who was the one behind the wheel, was shot. Police began investigations with interviewing eyewitnesses on the scene. They started with the friend that was in the car with Eloy. The friend said it had happened out of the blue. One minute they were driving down the street, the next a car pulled up alongside them and bullets started raining down. He reported that the car the shots were coming from was a 2004 Saturn Ion. As police interviewed more bystanders, they confirmed that the shots did indeed come from the Saturn. Some witnesses said that they saw a pair of young girls and that both of them had guns and fired shots. Others reported that they saw a girl and a boy and that only the boy had a gun. In one interview, a witness claimed that he saw both passengers fire weapons and that they were both men. Luckily, there was a security camera posted on a nearby street that captured the incident. The video showed that a Saturn was driving down the street in the opposite direction of Eloy's car, a Toyota Tacoma, and then the Saturn made a U-turn and started following Eloy. Police described the Saturn's U-turn as very abrupt and aggressive, almost as if seeing Eloy behind the wheel prompted the car to turn around. The Saturn increased speed and soon had to change lanes to pass Eloy's car, and as it did, gunshots fired from the vehicle. The video footage also captured the car's license plate number and the person behind the wheel. It was indeed a woman and she was wearing a white tank top. The next day, authorities pulled over a 2004 Saturn Ion with matching plates as the ones from the video. In the vehicle, there was a woman, her daughter, and an extended family member. All three women got taken in for questioning. Meet Marquia Angelia Hamilton. She's 19 years old, she works at Sunny's, a barbecue restaurant in Orlando, and she's interested in joining the military. When she's brought in, the police have her wait in an interrogation room while investigators prepare to question her. When Marquia is finally seen, she's told that she's here for a murder investigation. Again, she acts surprised. She says that, what do I have to do with that? She's interviewed by two detectives, a male detective, Overfield, who is actually the one in charge of the case, and a female detective, Sprague, who I guess took a special interest in the case and is helping him out. They apologize for making Marquia wait and start getting some preliminary information about her. We learn that Marquia has a boyfriend, Brandon. She also has a suspended license. The detectives swear her in and the atmosphere of the room clearly shifts. Detective Overfield gets right down to business. He asks Marquia if she worked in the last couple of days. She says she's worked on Wednesday the 22nd, the day before the incident, from 4 to 9 p.m. When they ask her about the next day, the day the shooting took place, Marquia corrected herself. She says she was actually working on Thursday from 4 to 9 p.m. and she had Wednesday off. I found it a little suspicious that she already started changing her alibi. I know we forget things sometimes, but come on. She already forgot about yesterday? Especially given what she says next. I would think I wouldn't forget that day whether it was guilty or innocent. Marquia says that she woke up at her boyfriend's house around 12 p.m. She got picked up by her cousin, Jaria, who had the Saturn. She explained to the detectives that even though it's her mother's car, Jaria drives it most of the time, even more than Marquia does since her boyfriend has a car and can usually drive her places. So Marquia gets picked up by Jaria. She needs to be at work by four, so she has some time to kill, and she and her cousin decide to smoke before her shift. They drive across town to pick up some from a place called Molly World, on Jernigan Avenue and West Anderson Street, and here's where things get a little fuzzy. Marquia claims that when they got to the neighborhood, they noticed a man running down the sidewalk fast. Marquia said that she thought it was curious and brought it to the attention of her cousin. That's when they heard gunshots, she said. So they drove out of there fast, almost crashing into a white truck and driving down a one-way street the wrong way before making their way to Marquia's residence a few blocks away. That's all the information she shared when the detectives first asked her and it matched up pretty well with what the surveillance tapes showed except for one key detail. No mention of where the gunshots came from. Marquia quickly moved on to the events that happened afterwards. She went to her house, washed her work clothes, smoked in the park, and headed to work. After work, Jaria picked her up, took her to Brandon's house, 
where they smoked again and then back home. Mercury's alibi for Thursday, July 23rd, 2020, would change many times while the investigators questioned her for the next hour. For example, at one point, Marquia said that she was actually picked up from work by Jaria's sister, not Jaria. She said Jaria was busy because she went to the hospital and learned that she was pregnant. Seems like a hard thing to forget if your cousin finds out if she's pregnant. Then later, because she was picked up by Jaria's sister and not Jaria, she apparently didn't go to her boyfriend's house and instead went straight home with Jaria's sister. Because some of the witnesses claimed that they saw men in the car, the detectives thought maybe Marquia and Jaria were merely passengers in the car and they were trying to protect the men involved. These investigators were looking for any possibility that someone else besides these two young women were involved in the shooting, but Marquia wasn't giving them much to work with. They mentioned some names of men Marquia knew, including her own brother and a man named Scotty, who Jaria was seeing and it was believed was the father of her child. Detective Sprague asked if either Marquia or Jaria had gotten involved in some revenge scheme or a beef any of these men could have possibly had. But Marquia insisted she had nothing to do with any of their business. Eventually, Detective Sprague just asked point blank, did you shoot? Marquia said no. She denied having ever touched a gun, let alone shoot one. But the detective insisted that multiple witnesses said they saw shots come from their car. I later learned that the detectives were very intentionally referred only to eyewitness reports and not the video evidence that they had proved that Marquia and Jaria were at the scene and the gunshots came from their car. This was a tactic. That way Marquia could build a key defense around the idea that witnesses were lying, so when the time came and a jury was shown the irrefutable video footage, it would prove any story Marquia told was false and further implicate her in the murder of Eloy. And that's exactly what she did. Multiple times the detectives told Marquia that several witnesses said the shots came from her car and time and time again, Marquia denied it. She remained calm about it, a little too calm. And even when she was told that it resulted in someone's life being taken away. A majority of Marquia's interrogation was spent figuring out the logistics, such as what streets she was on and where her destination was. And Marquia was also uncooperative with that. She claimed she couldn't remember or wasn't paying attention or needed to physically be at the location to describe it. So with still no confession, the detectives ended the interrogation and took Marquia to the scene so she could confirm her exact whereabouts during the shooting. After being held for nearly two hours, Marquia still wouldn't admit to her involvement in the shooting. Later, the investigators finally got a hold of Jaria and brought her in for questioning. Jaria Caitlin Antoinette Shield was also 19 years old. She also worked at Sunny's. She had a boyfriend named Scotty. And like we heard from Marquia's testimony, Jaria was pregnant. We learned that Jaria used to live in London, England, and that when she moved to the United States, there were complications with transferring her credits, so she never finished high school. We also learned that she too technically doesn't have a driver's license, despite being the driver the day of the shooting. She only had her learner's permit. Not off to a great start. Once she got sworn in, the, the detectives told Jaria that they had already spoken to Marquia, and apparently when the detectives and Marquia were driving to the scene, Marquia let more things slip, and that what she said made it clear to the detectives that the two girls were guilty. Apparently, Marquia accidentally admitted that the man that she saw running that day was in fact running from them and he even shot back at them with his own gun. But when presented with this accusation, Jaria brushed it aside and simply responded, I didn't say that. I'm here to tell you what I seen, what I did. Jaria went into a story about how the day of the shooting, she was at McDonald's when she got a call from Marquia to pick her up. So she brought food for herself, Marquia, and her boyfriend, Scotty. She picked up her cousin, then went to go out and buy they heard gunshots and left. They went to wash Marquia's work clothes and she took Marquia to work. So many of her facts match that of Marquia's original story. So I wouldn't be surprised if after Marquia was released, she talked to Jaria before she went in for questioning and tried to corroborate the same story. At this point, however, their false alibis were of no use, even if they did match. The detectives revealed they actually had all the evidence they needed to connect both her and Marquia to the crime. The only reason they wanted her for questioning was just to see if they could get the motive of why they did the shooting in the first place. Detective Sprague straight up asked, are you a cold-blooded killer? Jaria responded with, I wouldn't kill anybody. So then the detective proceeded to ask about certain scenarios. She was looking for any opportunity to better understand the situation and give either girl an out for the shooting that wouldn't paint them as cruel murderers. There were times she pleaded and begged them to tell her the truth. Later, Detective Sprague revealed that even her and Detective Overfield disagreed about the girl's motive. She believed there had to be a reason that the girls decided to shoot somebody, but Overfield was ready to lock them up. 
She says that if the girls would admit that there were extenuating circumstances, the detectives could work out a better deal for them in court. But if they stayed silent, the police had no choice but to interpret it as an act of carelessness and they could face life in prison. Especially since Jaria was pregnant, Detective Sprague practically pleaded with Jaria to confess and tell her the whole story. But Jaria stayed silent. Girl, they said you could be stuck in prison giving birth and you still didn't confess? Okay. And in the end, neither girl ever confessed to their crimes. Neither Marquia or Jaria mention Eloy's name or show any remorse for his murder, and the detectives are horrified by this. A few months later, on September 15, 2020, a 10-page arrest warrant for Marquia was filed by the police. Detective Sprague still believed the possibility that the girls were lying to protect someone else's actions, but most likely one of their boyfriends. By this time, detectives were able to verify that Marquia's boyfriend, Brandon, had an alibi and was not with them. However, they had reason to believe that Jaria's boyfriend, Scotty, was. And this would support the theory that the girls truly hadn't fired any weapons, nor were responsible for the murder of Eloy, and were merely trying to protect Scotty. Would they still be responsible for lying under oath and at the very least being accomplices to a homicide? Yeah, but that's a very big difference than being responsible for first degree murder. When Marquia is asked if Scotty was in the car, she still claims it was only Jaria and her. But she also says that earlier that day, before she was picked up, Jaria was driving around with Scotty and a man named Reggie. But by the time that she was picked up, it was just her and her cousin. This detail was never mentioned by Jaria in her initial interrogation. And as the interview goes on, Detective Sprague starts thinking that maybe the shooter was sitting in the front passenger seat and that Marquia was sitting behind them in the back seat. That might explain why some witnesses claim they saw men in the vehicle. Though Marquia rejected this theory, she had one major slip up that caught the attention of the investigators when she was talking about her tattoos. She tries to make the case that she couldn't have been the one to shoot because she had tattoos on her arm that would clearly make her identifiable. But when Detective Sprague asks when she got the tattoos and we see Marquia physically cower, and even though she corrected herself, she still tried to use that as evidence that she hadn't done it. That mistake would lead to the unraveling of Marquia's story. It's not only that Marquia lied about having the tattoo on her arm, despite only getting it a couple weeks ago, but it's also because she did the motion of shooting out of the car window and it matched the description of one of the witnesses gave. And this is when we see the detective's two months of hard work pay off. It's true. The moment when Marquia showed the detectives how she would have fired the gun was definitely a nail in the coffin. So now the detectives had a theory that Marquia and Jaria were responsible for the shooting, but that they had originally set out not to kill anyone, but to send a message to someone on that street. Maybe there was some bad blood between one of their boyfriends or even them, and maybe they just wanted to scare whoever it was. Regardless of what they meant to do, what ended up happening was an innocent man died and they were responsible. The last recorded activity on Marquia's case was in March 2021, where she was awaiting a pretrial hearing. Since then, sources say she's been out on bond and are awaiting trial. Drea wouldn't be arrested until the following year, January 22nd, 2021. She's also out on bail, and in April of 2023, Drea had a status hearing and is still awaiting a verdict. Like I said before, this case is far from over. Was it a revenge killing? Was Eloy involved in some shady business deals with one of Marquia's or Jaria's friends? Had he wronged one of the girls in some separate incident? Or was it truly just for the heck of it? As far as Eloy's family knew, he had no association with either of the girls. Eloy's cousin William spoke to the news and said he wasn't just another number. Somebody who succumbed to the unfortunate events that were happening in the world we live in. He was a very good person. Detective Sprague and Overfield were disappointed and disgusted at the cavalier attitudes Marquia and Jaria displayed in their interrogations. It's crazy to me how heartless these girls seem to be, so heartless that they never acknowledge their involvement in what happened to Eloy, even until at the very end, even now. Since the case is still underway, new evidence could always appear, but as of now, Marquia and Jaria's fate is looking pretty grim, especially with all the footage of them mercilessly lying to the police and looking so careless in the midst of a homicide investigation. Thanks for joining us on today's episode of Killer Bites, the show giving you bite-sized coverage of the hottest true crime cases.